Good evening, mga mga angeles, and you're watching Eagle News International on tonight's headlines. President Bongbong Marcos Jr. told United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken that the 70-year-old Mutual Defense Treaty, or MDT, between Manila and Washington is in constant evolution as China conducts military drills around nearby Taiwan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken affirms the U.S.'s ironclad commitment to its defense treaty with the Philippines as he meets his counterpart, Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo, amid military drills of China around Taiwan. And Filipinos in Israel are advised to be vigilant and stay away from Golan Heights and places near the Lebanon and Gaza borders. The advisory was issued today as tensions flared between Palestinian militants and Israelis after the latter launched an airstrike on Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip. And Kiev and Moscow accused each other of striking Europe's largest nuclear site, causing a reactor stoppage as three grain ships departed Ukraine under a deal to avert food shortages. First in our news, President Bongbong Marcos Jr. today told U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that a 70-year-old mutual defense treaty between Manila and Washington is in constant evolution as China conducts military drills around nearby Taiwan. This move also came in response to a visit to Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, which prompted fury in China. President Marcos said Pelosi's visit only demonstrated the existing intensity of of the conflict rather than adding to tensions. Take a look. It is particularly time your arrival here. Uh, as we know, in this region, there have been many, many issues. The last few days have uh, raised uh, and put to the fore some of them. The visit of, the, of uh, your House Speaker and Pelosi. Uh, coming here, really just, uh, I do not think, to be perfectly uh, candid, I did not think it raised the intensity, it just demonstrated how the intensity of the conflict has, has been, it actually has been at that level for a good while now. Um, but we sort of got used to the idea and the side. But nonetheless, uh, this just demonstrates how how volatile the uh, international diplomatic sea is the uh, uh, mutual defense treaty is uh, in constant uh, in constant uh, evolution uh, I like to think of it. and uh, the um, the other we the United States as I spoke uh, as we spoke uh, ambassador at some length uh, when she came to the Central Convention uh, is that the, we cannot, we can no longer isolate one part of our relationship from the other. Uh, we are too, too, uh, too closely, too closely tied uh, because of the special relationship between the United States and the Philippines. And the history that we have uh, that we have shared, and of course all the um, uh, assistance and help and uh, uh, support that we have received from the United States over the years, and they can no longer be categorized as one thing or another because they cover such a large, uh, large, large scope. I know that. Uh you take office, the inbox is very high. <laughs> the outbox, not quite as high, so I very much appreciate it. And I think it really is um, evidence of exactly what you're saying, Mr. President. The, the, our relationship is quite extraordinary because it is really founded in friendship. Uh, it's forged as well uh, in partnership, and it's strengthened by the fact that it's an alliance as well. Uh, to your point, the people, the people ties between us are almost uh, unique, and it's something that we 
tremendously valued uh, in the United States, just as I know uh, you do here. But we're also working together as partners in so many different areas, particularly uh, economically. Um, and of course, uh, the alliance uh, is strong and I believe can grow even stronger. Uh, we're committed to the Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, we're committed to working with you on shared uh, challenges. But I think what's so uh, striking to me, Mr. President, is that we are working together on bilateral issues between us. We're working together in the region. And increasingly, we're working globally because so many of the challenges we face are global in nature, whether it's uh, COVID-19, uh, we've been proud to be your partner in working on that and protecting all of our people, uh, whether it's climate and the need to deal with that uh, existential challenge, uh, or whether it's uh, the, the impact of all these new technologies on the lives of our people. In these and so many other areas, um, the work we're doing together matters. It matters to uh, people back home in the United States, and I, I hope and believe it matters to people here in the Philippines. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to deepen uh, everything we've already been doing, and uh, we're grateful to be working with you and your administration. The MDT, or Mutual Defense Treaty, signed between the two nations in 1951, calls for both nations to come to each other's defense in case of an armed attack. Blinken's meeting with Marcus came after China launched a series of huge military exercises around Taiwan that have been condemned by the U.S. and other Western allies. The People's Liberation Army has also declared multiple no-go danger zones around Taiwan, straggling major shipping lanes and coming within 20 kilometers of the island shores at some points. The move came in response to a visit to Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, which prompted fury in China. And today is the third day of the war games. Taiwan accused the Chinese military of simulating an attack on its main island as they deployed fighter jets and warships just 400 kilometers north of the Philippines. Taiwan President Chai Ing-wen calls China's live-fire military drills around the island a continued deliberately heightened military threat. Take a look. 今天中国在台湾周边进行实弹设计演习now, Taiwan said, uh, its military said it observed multiple Chinese planes and ships operating in the Taiwan Strait on Saturday, believing them to be simulating an attack on the self-ruled democracy's main island. Beijing on Saturday continued some of its largest ever military drills around Taiwan, exercises aimed at practicing a blockade and ultimate invasion of the island, according to analysts. In a bid to show just how close China's forces have been getting to Taiwan shores, Beijing's military overnight released a video of an Air Force pilot filming the island's coastline and mountains from his cockpit. And the Eastern Command of the Chinese Army shared a photo it said was taken of a warship patrolling in seas near Taiwan, the island shoreline clearly visible in the background. Beijing also said they would hold a live fire drill in the southern part of the Yellow Sea located between China and the Korean Peninsula from today until August 15th. China state broadcaster CCTV has reported that Chinese missiles have flown directly over Taiwan during the exercises, a major escalation if confirmed. Beijing is yet to formally confirm whether missiles overflew the islands during the drills, while Taipei has refused to confirm or deny the flight paths, citing intelligence concerns. China's official Xinhua News Agency reported that the military, quote, flew more than 100 warplanes, including fighters and bombers, during the exercises, as well as over 10 destroyers and frigates. In Cambodia now, at the ASEAN meeting, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi urged Washington not to escalate tensions as relations between the two superpowers nosedive over Taiwan. This was at a press conference on the sidelines of an ASEAN summit in Phnom Penh. Take a look. 
United States has conveyed to the PRC consistently and repeatedly that we do not seek and will not provoke a crisis. President Tsai has said the same thing. We anticipated that China might take steps like this. In fact, we described this exact scenario. The fact is, the Speaker's visit was peaceful. There is no justification for this extreme, disproportionate. Well, this visit by Speaker Pelosi to the Taiwan region is a despicable farce. And by doing that, she has lifted the rod only to drop on her own feet. Because that only reinforced the consensus of the international community on the One China principle. It only makes the 1.4 billion Chinese people even more united and determined to advance the process of building a socialist, strong, modern country and to achieve national reunification. China's position is justified, it is reasonable, and it is legal. And the measures taken by China are firm, strong, and measured. The military exercises taken by China are open, transparent, and professional. They are consistent with domestic and international laws, as well as international practice. They are intended to send a warning to the perpetrator and a warning to the Taiwan independence forces. Imagine that if this important norm of night interference is ignored and discarded, then the world will return to the law of the jungle. The United States and other countries alike will become even more unscrupulous in their effort to deal with all countries, in particular medium-sized and smaller countries, from a position of strength. And we should never allow that to happen. We should not allow humanity to take a step back and regress. And I believe that all countries need to come together to ensure that this will not happen. China said Friday it was ending cooperation with the U.S. on a litany of key issues including climate change, anti-drug efforts and military talks. The world's two largest polluters last year pledged to work together to accelerate climate action this decade and vowed to meet regularly to address the climate crisis. Pelosi, who Beijing also hit with sanctions for the visit, has defended her trip to Taiwan, saying that Washington would not allow China to isolate the island. The ministry said they sanctioned Pelosi because she was seriously interfering in China's internal affairs and seriously undermining China's sovereignty and territorial integrity with her visit. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken affirmed the U.S. Uh, ironclad commitment to its defense treaty with the Philippines as he meets his counterpart, Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo, amid military drills of China around Taiwan. Manalo urged concerned parties to keep communication lines open to prevent an escalation of tensions. Let's listen in. The Philippines is an irreplaceable friend, partner, and ally to the United States. This is our oldest alliance in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we talked as well about our security partnership, and I reiterated our ironclad commitment to the U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty and reaffirmed that an armed attack on Philippines armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft in the South China Sea would invoke U.S. mutual defense commitments under that treaty. We always stand by our partners. It's important to underscore that because of what's happening north of here in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, on the issue of the Taiwan, well, the Philippines and ASEAN have always been ready to see how we can help in any way to uh, reduce the tensions. May I just say at this important point, as mentioned by Tony, it's uh, from a Philippine perspective, very important that the lines of communication be maintained between uh, the parties concerned, especially uh, as a way of trying to um, prevent uh, matters from escalating and reducing tensions. And the Philippines will always see how we can encourage to maintain such lines of communication. Well, first of all, let me begin by saying that our defense and security engagements with the United States uh, continue to be a pillar of our uh, bilateral relationship. And our defense uh, relations are really anchored on the mutual defense treaty.
We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. The year is 1931, but the world is still stuck in the steam age. Pops? It should have worked by now. Do you feel anything? That is precisely what I'd like to know. <laughs> Dito lang sa Net 25. Panalo tayo pag together. Walang talo pag together. Let's get together. Sa Net I was able to talk to foreign policy security analyst uh, Mr. Lucio Blanco Pitlo III, who weighs in, who weighed in on the recent visit of U.S. Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan and its impact on ASEAN, specifically the Philippines. Factors like the Philippines' proximity to Taiwan, our large OFW population, our trade investment relations with China, our mutual defense agreements with the U.S., all these entangle us in this potential diplomatic geopolitical powder keg. Let's listen in. So the question now is why we should be concerned with the disagreements with China and Taiwan. In terms of uh, regional security in the Indo-Pacific area, does our mutual defense treaty with the U.S. cover this conflict and uh, to what extent? Must we, must the Philippines send troops or allocate resources to resist uh, armed attacks? And how should we protect the interests of overseas uh, Filipino workers also in, uh, in this conflict if China and Taiwan engage in uh, these uh, aggressive exercises? Well, yes. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, extremely important uh, for the, the ASEAN and uh, most importantly for the Philippines. We are the closest Southeast Asian country to uh, the Taiwan Strait. We are actually the uh, immediate neighbor of Taiwan to the south. And as you said, we have, I think, close to 200,000 Filipinos working, studying, living in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, their safety and security is of utmost importance to us. And uh, at the same time, we are, of course, a long time. Uh, ally of the U.S. We have a mutual defense treaty dating back 1951, reaffirmed in succeeding um, military agreements like the Visiting Forces Agreement of uh, 99, and uh, of course the 2004 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. On the other hand, China is also our largest trade partner, and uh, of course a big tourist market, um, a big investor, and uh, of course in recent years becoming an important infrastructure builder. So it's important that we manage our relations with these two superpowers. Unfortunately, their relations in recent years has not been good. And uh, actually from not being good, it's actually worsening. And that Taiwan Strait is becoming an area where we see this animosity uh, between the two uh, really becoming apparent. And there is a uh, risk that the Philippines might uh, get entangled, that we may get dragged in a conflict we do not wish and we do not want. Um, and so because of our proximity uh, to the Taiwan Strait, to, to Taiwan, 
uh, actually uh, in some of the exercise areas uh, of the PLA, uh, some of those uh, actually already include uh, our EEZ in the northern part of uh, Luzon and the Batanes area. So we are really feeling the heat, you know, of, of this very tense situation. I think our foremost uh, priority, of course, goes to our Kababayats, our, our OFWs there. I think the uh, Department of Migrant Workers have to uh, draw contingency plans. No? If in case the situation required immediate evacuation. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, we have to be also very concerned about uh, suffering potential collateral damage, you know. Due to the conflict, you know our proximity to to this potential area of conflict, and uh, we know that um, we have signed uh, agreements that allow U.S. to station troops in the Philippines and provide them access to some of our strategic bases. Now, uh, there's a risk that we might be come, we might be in the firing line of Beijing if uh, conflict break out uh, in the Taiwan Strait because of the presence of U.S. troops and uh, the prepositioning of U.S. Uh, assets uh, in some of our locations here in the Philippines. And uh, that is why uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and uh, the military, the Philippine Armed Forces, have expressed their concern about the situation and said you know, that they are closely monitoring developments. Let's hope that uh, cooler heads will prevail, that we won't have to uh, you know, push the panic button uh, b because the consequences would be severe, which would be very dire, even unthinkable. President Marcos said his foreign policy during his Sona, uh, the country remains a friend to all, an enemy to none. Uh, but we have this mutual defense treaty with uh, the U.S. What do you think will be the current administration's diplomatic and strategic shift now that it is as, uh, it is inevitable and that we are about to be faced uh, with this conflict? Well, um, I, I think it's, it's not yet inevitable, but the risk is, is, is there. No? Okay. And the risk grows, you know, as the protagonists take steps, you know, uh, towards this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, uh, if you see the other side, uh, not only as your rival, but as your potential enemy, take steps. Uh, you know, to uh, towards that uh, notion, then uh, that will naturally elicit a reaction from the other side. So this is a potential security dilemma, the unvirtuous cycle of you know arming yourself uh, because of the concern that the other side will uh, you know take coercive uh, measures to change the status quo. And uh, so again. Uh, the Philippines has little agency, you know, uh, even if we work with our friends in ASEAN to try to uh, offer our offices, you know, for both sides to have dialogue. Um, if Washington and Beijing uh, will not be able to hold on to, the, to those guardrails, you know, uh, to manage their competition, and, and Taiwan is really a very touch, a sensitive touch point you know, for both sides. Yeah. Then uh, the the risk of other countries uh, being uh, entangled into this conflict has uh, you know grows large. Yeah. And so the mutual defense treaty, of course, provides you know that uh, both U.S. and the Philippines have to come to each other's uh, help when uh, an attack was made. So if uh, there would be actions against Taiwan, and U.S. will respond accordingly, and U.S. gets attacked in the process of uh, taking steps to defend Taiwan, then the Philippines uh, may be uh, put in the crossfire. And, of course, that is the big concern uh, that, uh, of course, given given all the problems that uh, we, we are already facing, uh, this will be of, of very serious and immediate, uh, uh, you know, it would require uh, urgent attention you know, from our uh, government. What do you think would be some of the steps to soften the impact of uh, 
the visit or any aggressive stance in the near future? Well, of course, we, we, we hope that after the uh, conclusion of the exercises, that there won't be any further overt, you know, military actions by either side. You know? But uh, uh, let, let's see, you know, the dust uh, after the visit of Pelosi to Taiwan already settled. And uh, so far, I think it would be a combination of economic and military responses from, from China, uh, specifically targeting, you know, Taiwan, which they consider as uh, a renegade province, you know, part of their territory and what uh, China considers a core interest. And so, uh, of course, countries would uh, try to refrain, you know, from, from taking steps uh, that would uh, incite you know, further tensions. So maybe uh, a possible natural cooling process, you know, after the, the tense uh, visit. And uh, we'll see you know, what happens next. You know? But uh, I think after the exercises, the economic sanctions against Taiwan and other countries that may express you know, openly support you know, for Taiwan or the, the visit of uh, Speaker Pelosi to Taiwan, they, they may also likewise suffer from potential economic retaliation you know, from, from mainland because the uh, level of uh, infuriation, you know, the rage and uh, agitation on the part of China is really that strong, you know? and uh, because they think uh, a line has been crossed, you know. Um, so let, let's hope that uh, you know both sides will um, probably find uh, another way, you know, to, to de-escalate the situation. Unfortunately, the visit, you know, came days after President Xi and President Biden had the telephone conversation. You know? yes. And I think in that call, there was hope that at least uh, both sides, if they cannot be friends or uh, if they cannot improve the situation, they would at least prevent it from getting worse. Yeah. But the visit uh, came and of course the temperature in that area uh, shoot up again. Uh, let, 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 let's hope you know, that uh, uh, there would be uh, some back channel discussions uh, between US and, and uh, China. And that, uh, of course, the uh, uh, the concern of, of mainland that uh, what they consider as separatist or independent leading elements uh, in, in Taiwan would not uh, be emboldened, you know, or capitalized on the visit, you know, to uh, take uh, further measures, you know, that would uh, exacerbate the situation. Let's hope it won't uh, come to that. Well, yes, please. Can President Biden do something to improve the situation? Well, uh, th there was already a telephone call ma made before the visit. Um, maybe a back channel talks uh, or, or, or even uh, maybe a, again another phone call before the uh, elections, uh, midterm elections of November. And uh, of course, uh, this November, there will be, again, a series of uh, meetings uh, here in ASEAN. And I think it is an opportunity, you know, uh, for presidents, uh, top leaders of both sides, you know, to uh, be present in Southeast Asia, whether in the G20 in Bali uh, or the, the APEC uh, summit in Thailand or the ASEAN summit in Cambodia. You know? So... Um, ASEAN uh, can be a place you know, where leaders, top leaders on both sides can meet on the sidelines and, you know, discuss uh, this uh, uh, brewing situation and find ways to uh, lower down the temperature. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for your insight, uh, Mr. Pedro. I was hoping that ASEAN also could play a role. Uh, in lowering the temperature, and as you say, thank you very much for all that. Thank you very Always much. Always welcome, Paul. In today's southern news, Israel hit Gaza with airstrikes today, and a Palestinian militant group retaliated with a barrage of rocket fire in the territory's worst escalation of violence since the war last year. Estoy en Israel hace 22 años. 
y bueno, estas son situaciones que lamentablemente ya cuando llegamos sabíamos que podían ocurrir. Eh, me radiqué en Ashkelon hace 17 años. Eh, hubieron años eh, peores, situaciones peores. Por supuesto que lo que deseamos todos es que esto se termine pronto y que en algún momento podamos llegar a... a a tener una vida más tranquila, nosotros y toda la gente que vive alrededor nuestro. Now Israel has said it was forced to launch a preemptive operation against Islamic Jihad, insisting the group was planning an imminent attack following days of tensions along the Gaza border. Islamic Jihad said that initial Israeli bombardment amounted to a declaration of war before it unleashed a barrage of rocket towards Israel. The rocket fire and Israeli strikes were continuing today, risking a repeat of an 11-day conflict in May of 2021. The devastated Gaza and forced countless Israelis to rush to bomb shelters. Daily life in the enclave has come to a standstill with streets largely deserted and most shops closed. Some power lines have been disrupted by the Israeli airstrikes. Health authorities in Gaza, a Palestinian enclave controlled by the Islamist group Hamas, said 11 people have been killed by Israel's bombardment, including a five-year-old girl with more than 80 others in Injured. Israel's army estimated that its operation has killed 15 militants. Early on Saturday, Israel broadened its operation against Islamic Jihad, a group that is aligned with Hamas, but often acts independently. Meanwhile, Filipinos in Israel are advised to be vigilant and to stay away from Golan Heights and places near the Lebanon and Gaza borders. The advisory was issued today as tensions flared between Palestinian militants and Israelis after the latter launched an airstrike on Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip. The strike reportedly killed a top commander of a Palestinian militant group and nine others, including a five-year-old kid, triggering a return retaliatory rocket barrage. The embassy, citing the Home Front Command, said educational activities are prohibited in the Gaza envelope and South Israel. It likewise urged Filipinos to take necessary precautions when riding public vehicles and refrain from going to crowded places as much as possible. The United Nations said the continuing escalation in the region is very dangerous and urged concerned parties to immediately halt the rocket launch. In today's southern news, a regional envoy tasked with brokering peace in Myanmar admitted today that even Superman cannot solve the crisis, capping a week of foreign ministerial meetings that ultimately yielded little progress. ASEAN Special Envoy Prak Khan, who has made two trips to Myanmar since the coup, dampened expectations for major progress in the short term. He also flagged a possible third trip to Myanmar in early September, contingent upon progress on the five-point plan. Man, take a look. I told a meeting yesterday after my briefing about our effort to help Myanmar. I told them, I'm sorry, I'm just a special envoy. I'm not a super, superhero, not Superman. And I think that even Superman cannot solve Myanmar problem. Issues cannot be solved by one meeting by two meetings by many years of meeting. Negotiation take years. Like, like the issue in Myanmar. After two visits of the special envoy, two visits only, some people start to lose patience and ask for result. I decided to retrieve that, that plan for the third visit, uh, not to do that third visit on, 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 on September. Especially if, and I see, say it clearly, publicly, if more execution are conducted, then things will have to be reconsidered. Our position will also have to be reconsidered.
Earlier in the week, Malaysia, which has led calls for tougher action, indicated that Myanmar could face suspension from the bloc should members not see progress ahead of the leaders' summit. Myanmar has spiraled into civil war since the putsch in February last year, with the death toll from the military's brutal crackdown on dissent passing 2,100 according to a local monitoring group. The 10th country, ASEAN, has spearheaded so far fruitless efforts to resolve the turmoil and acknowledged in a joint statement on Friday the lack of progress around a five-point crisis resolution plan. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken urged the international community to reject the Myanmar junta's uh, sham elections planned for next year. He said they would be neither free nor fair. Take a look. We also have to increase economic pressure, uh, do more to stop the flow of arms and revenue to the regime, insist on accountability for the atrocities that have been committed, and we strongly encourage the international community not to endorse the regime's plans for sham elections next year, they can be neither free nor fair under present conditions. One of the participants in the East Asia Summit and ASEAN Regional Forum meetings, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, visited with regime leaders in uh, Burma just a few days ago, calling them a friendly partner. That directly flies in the face of ASEAN's hard work to bring the violence to an end. On Wednesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov wished the junta success in the proposed August 2023 polls during talks with top generals in the capital Naypyida. Lavrov said Russia backed the junta's efforts to stabilize the country. Isolated and sanctioned by many Western countries, the junta has turned into allies to allies Russia and China, who have been accused by rights groups and a UN expert of arming Myanmar's military with weapons used to attack civilians. Meanwhile, Kiev and Moscow accuse each other of striking Europe's largest nuclear site, causing a reactor stoppage as three grain ships already departed Ukraine under a deal to avert food shortages. Take a look. Today, occupants created a certain, of course, a very dangerous situation for всіх Європі вони обстріляли Запорізьку АЕС, причому двічі за день. Це найбільша атомна станція на нашому континенті, і будь-які обстріли цього об'єкту це відвертий, зухвалий злочин, акт терору. Росія повинна нести відповідальність вже за сам факт створення загрози АЕС. І це не тільки, не тільки ще один аргумент на користь визнання Росії державою спонсором тероризму. Це аргумент і на користь того, щоб застосувати жорсткі санкції проти всієї російської атомної галузі від Росатому до усіх пов'язаних компаній і осіб. Це суто питання безпеки. Russian troops have occupied the Zaporizhia nuclear plant in southern Ukraine since the early days of their invasion, and Kiev has accused them of storing heavy weapons there. Moscow, in turn, has accused Ukrainian forces of targeting the plant. Three strikes were recorded on the side of the plant near one of the power blocks where the nuclear reactor is located, according to Ukraine's state-run nuclear power plant operator, Energo Atom, in a statement. It also said there are risks of hydrogen leakage and radioactive spraying. The fire danger is high. According to Energo Atom, it did not report any casualties. The defense ministry in Moscow denied the reports and said Ukrainian armed units carried out three artillery strikes on the territory of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the city of Energodar. Ukrainian forces are conducting a counteroffensive in the south where they claim to have retaken more than 50 villages previously controlled by Moscow. After food prices reached historic highs in March following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, world food prices fell sharply last month. And that is according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which attributed the falling prices to a double-digit drop in the cost of cereal and vegetable oil. FAO Chief Economist Maximo Terrero Cullen hailed a welcome decline, especially from the point of view of access to food. Take a look. And today I am going to report about the FAO food price index, which fell for the fourth consecutive month in July, after reaching an all-time high in March of this year, since the FAO began publishing monthly figures in January 1990. 
This decline was the steepest monthly fall in the index since October 2008. But the decline from very high food commodity prices is welcome, but many uncertainties remain, including the still high fertilizer prices that impact farmers' livelihoods and future production prospects for the next year, and the global economic outlook and currency movements, all of which pose ongoing constraints uh, for the global food security. Lower crude oil prices are also a welcome sign, uh, which could lead uh, to a considerable downward pressure on food commodities, but uncertainties over gas availability, which prices are still increasing, are important and could destabilize uh, still the fertilizer market and the feed supplies. We will have the head of these. Now, he also warned that many risks still weigh on global food security, such as a recession or high fertilizer prices and their potential impact on production and farmers' livelihood. Meanwhile, three more cargo ships loaded with Ukrainian grain left the country's ports on Friday as part of the UN-led bid to relieve global food insecurity. The green light for the shipment of more than 58,000 tons of corn was issued by the Joint Coordination Center of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, a deal agreed between the UN, Ukraine, Russia and Turkey. It also follows the first commercial shipment of more than 26,000 tons of corn from the Ukrainian port of Odessa earlier this week aboard the Sierra Leone flag Razoni. The ship arrived in Istanbul's waters on Tuesday evening after sailing from Ukraine's main Black Sea port of Odessa on Monday and set a course for Tripoli in Lebanon. The news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. deny that the value of our money now can afford much less than it could a year ago. Maraming mga bagay ang nakaapekto sa ating ekonomiya at ang karamihan sa atin ay nagulat dahil tayo ay hindi handa. How do we stretch our budget and still save a few? Kapos na nga ang pera, mag invest pa ba? Perhaps it's timely for us to discuss how we can mitigate the effects of the economic crunch and still be able to tide over the wave of financial uncertainties by learning how to grow our money. If you live simply, then the, what you need to save will be a smaller amount. Mm -hmm. But if you live grand, and of course, mas malaki rin yung kailangan mong ipunin. It's not what you make, it's what you save. Open for business with Cesar Vallejos, Sunday, 9 p.m. Sassine Throwback. The year is 1931, but the world is still stuck in the steam age. Pops? It should have worked by now. Do you feel anything? That is precisely what I'd like to know. Ngayong <laughs> linggo, <laughs> Alas ng tanghali, dito lang sa Net 25. Panalo tayo pag together, walang talo pag together, let's get together. Sa Net 25. Welcome back. The CDC and Prevention and the Task Force for Global Health is going to co-host in person the 11th International Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases. More from Jeff Sanidad. Jeff. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and the Task Force for Global Health will co-host in person the 11th International Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases, or ICEID. The conference will run from August 7 to 10, 2022, at the Hyatt Regency Atlanta Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia. Held every three years, the conference brings together more than 1,500 public health professionals from around the world to exchange the latest information on 
issues affecting the emergence, spread and control of infectious diseases. The three-day program includes plenary and panel sessions with invited speakers, oral abstract and poster presentations and multiple scientific and public health exhibitors. These sessions will all focus on emerging and re-emerging infections. Selected oral presentations include how mask wearing varies across different settings, turning farmers into disease detectives, and a new paradigm for pandemic preparedness. Jeff Sinidad, Washington, D.C., Eagle News, will live in extraordinary time. Major flooding in California's Death Valley stranded approximately a thousand people, buried cars and shut down all roads into and out of the famously parched National Park. No injuries were reported according to the National Park Service, but around 60 cars were bogged down under several feet of debris. A total of 1.46 inches of rain fell in the park's Furnace Creek area, almost tying the previous daily record of 1.47 inches. The average annual rainfall is less than two inches a year. Higher temperatures caused by climate change mean the atmosphere holds more moisture, unleashing more rain. According to UN climate experts, even if the world manages to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, some regions will experience an increase in frequency, intensity, and quantity of heavy rainfall. The risk of heavy precipitation episodes increases with temperature rise. Still in the U.S., some of the busiest airports in the U.S. from D.C. to New York are on ground delay and uh, as severe storms move in. Thousands of flights delayed or canceled. Meanwhile, uh, tens and millions of Americans are under heat alert, temperatures surging into the 90s and into triple digits, and increasingly severe weather have been tied to climate change. Dallas topping triple digits at 100 degrees four times. And then there is the storm. Take a look. At 6.52 p.m. this evening, DC Fire and EMS received a call for report of a lightning strike with multiple patients here in Lafayette Park. Well, obviously, anytime there's lightning, you should uh, go indoors or you should go to a safe place. And uh, Trees, of course, are not safe places. Three people, including an elderly couple, celebrating their 56th wedding anniversary were pronounced dead Friday after being struck by lightning in a park near the White House. The lightning hit Lafayette Square, a small park across the street from the White House, shortly before 7 p.m. local time. All the victims were taken to local hospitals, but on Friday morning, the Metropolitan Police confirmed that two of them, 75-year-old Donna Mueller and 76-year-old James Mueller from Giantsville in Wisconsin had been pronounced dead. The couple had been high school sweethearts and were in the capital to mark their wedding anniversary. Their niece, Michelle McNett, told the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Later Friday, a third victim, a 29-year-old man, also succumbed to his injuries. The victims had apparently sought shelter from the storm under one of the park's trees. Meanwhile, the French government said that it had activated the crisis task force to coordinate efforts to alleviate the impacts of a historic drought exacerbated by a third extreme heat wave of the summer. Take a look. Sauf que on est dans un contexte qui ne correspond plus à aucune habitude. On n'a jamais connu une sécheresse comme celle-là. Et la mauvaise nouvelle, c'est que aussi loin que notre regard porte, on n'a aucune raison de penser que ça va s'arrêter. Et c'est même pire que ça, puisqu'on a canicule et sécheresse, et donc un cercle vicieux qui fait que, à cause de la sécheresse, on a peu de ressources, et à cause de la canicule, on a besoin de davantage de, de ressources. De ressources. Oui. Water restrictions have already been ordered in nearly all of France's 96 mainland departments with 62 at the highest alert level. And the Meteo France Weather Agency has forecast little relief for the coming weeks. Soaring temperatures have increased the evaporation of lakes and rivers whose levels have fallen just as irrigation needs are increasing ahead of autumn harvest. The state-controlled electricity provider EDF has also had to reduce output at several nuclear plants 
sense because river temperatures have become too high, which means water used to cool reactors cannot be safely returned to natural waterways. Several other European countries have also issued severe drought warnings with the EU urging members this week to reuse treated urban wa wastewater for the continent's parched farms. The crisis has kindled fears that yields of grain and other crops will suffer further raising food prices already climbing. On a lighter note, a giant digital dog appeared on screens in Tokyo's busy shopping and business district of Shibuya, the latest 3D display in the mega city following a massive 4K cat that went viral last year. Take a look. あの、ま、見てもわかるように、いろんな、あの、マルチの the new installation sees the dog appear at the top of each hour across eight different billboards, leaping from screen to screen and catching a frisbee. The digital canine is the same Akita breed as Hachiko, a dog famous in Shibuya with its very own statue outside the area's busy train station. And finally, in our news, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin launched six people to space, including the first from Egypt and Portugal on the company's sixth crewed flight. Both the New Shepard suborbital sub rocket and crew capsule separately returned to the base in the West Texas desert, completing the N-22 mission around 11 minutes after liftoff. Now, the crew included Egyptian engineer Sarah Sabri, and Portuguese entrepreneur Mario Ferreira, both the first people of their countries to leave Earth. It also included Kobe Cotton, one of the five co-founders of the YouTube sports and comedy channel, Dude Perfect, which boasts more than 57 million followers. A Blue Origin spokeswoman confirmed all six crew were paying passengers, though Sabri's seat was sponsored by nonprofit Space for Humanity. Blue Origin has not revealed its Ticket prices. Past flights have included celebrity guests who have flown for free, including Star Trek legend William Shatner. As always, I'll end the day on a thoughtful note. Our ability to look back and smile at our past is proof that God's plan is to keep us moving forward. This has been Eagle News International. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay alert, stay informed, because we live in extraordinary times. Good night.